Greetings! Welcome to the Sci-Fi Pubcast, the podcast that tries to be a pub, and perhaps someday a pub, that tries to be a podcast. As always, we are looking for customers to come visit our bar, so if you're passionate about something want to be on a podcast, well, let us know, because this bar is all about community. If you want to help us out, please consider leaving a five-star review wherever you find the show, joining our Discord server, and subscribing to our YouTube channel. I'm Joel. I'm the owner of the Sci-Fi Pubcast, so to speak. We're looking around. I'm looking around. And my God, we have two of our dedicated staff members at the bar today. We have Kerry Simpson and Derek Beebe. Hi, guys. Hey. Hi. Hey. How are you guys doing? What's I'm up? I'm doing then? good. I'm doing good. Kerry, what's the latest in California? Does it still exist? California does still exist. We have not been blown off the map, mm. despite... Mother Nature's um, attempts this week. We, we, uh, my, my, our, my dojo, my classes have been, have been, you know, forced to go back to Zoom all week because it was way too windy to, to, you know, beat each other in the parking lot. Oh, wow. So, <laughs> which I real, which I realize is not as big of a crisis as what's going on in most of the country, mm. but, you know. Yeah, it is what it is. Uh, at least there's no snow in California in L.A., right? Or no, the, no, 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 the no. Los Angeles and it's actually, area. It, it, and uh, from what I can see outside, it looks gorgeous right now. I'm just not going out until tomorrow. Mm. Fair enough. Fair enough. Derek, how's the hills of Pennsylvania doing? We have been getting snow every two days. It's been pretty annoying. <laughs> like. <laughs> Last year, we had one storm in October, one storm in April, and nothing in between. And this year, we're getting a snowstorm, like, every two days. Oh, wow. Well, so, uh... Yeah, but climate change is a thing. Yeah. Yeah. I know, so still snow in Ottawa, Ontario, Canada. It was really cold up until probably today. It's uh, still under a uh, freezing, but uh, at least it's not, like, minus 20 or something like that Celsius. So that's good. That's encouraging. Uh, Derek, you know, I hate to bring up the whole work thing, but, you know, we are at a pub, uh, which is, uh, you know, where we talk a lot of science fiction, pop culture. But I do need to ask you about our kitchen. How is our kitchen doing? Nice and clean because, you know, as the beginning of the year, it's it's been my new, you know, my New Year's goal to actually clean things for once. Nice. And and my offering for this week is it's it's a bit of a smorgasbord. I've got coffee, I've got caffeine pills, I've got Four loco. I've got energy shots, because you're going to need it to get through this movie. Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, that's good. So let's or, keep... or you're going to need it for the heart attack you want to give yourself. <laughs> <laughs> for all that, with all that, you know, caffeine and shit. I tried to get one of those uh, adrenaline needles that you inject straight into the heart, but I, I wasn't able to get any of those. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, those probably cost money, Derek, and, you, and we know how you are with money. Yeah, yeah. That's science, folks. That's science. Uh, let's <laughs> see. Uh, what's happening with me? Yeah, I'm still in Ottawa for probably another nine or ten weeks. Uh, I'm making a big move in my world. Uh, yes, I'm leaving my current employer, and I'm going to do uh, a PhD in law. Yes, I'm going back to the University of Western Ontario, a.k.a. Western University, located in London, Ontario, Canada. That's where I went Ooh. to law school way back in the day. Uh, I'm going to be studying under some of uh, the podcasts, probably uh, listeners probably know quite well, um, uh, Dr. Renner Graham. Yeah, he's going to be my new boss. Is that like a conflict of interest or something? I don't know, but uh, I'm a student. I'm I, a poor I... As PhD long as they candidate. don't fall in love with each other. <laughs> well, Randall's married. So. <laughs> There's that. <laughs> uh, yeah. So I'm... wait, 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 wait. So you're the boss here, and then Randall's going to be your boss in real life. That that's just weird. It is quite weird, and yeah. Uh, hopefully, I'll be learning a lot. I'm going back to academia. The idea is to be more creative and to write and to publish. I'm starting probably several different creative uh, projects. Plus, I'm going to continue on with the sci-fi podcast. Plus, you know, d doing a PhD over four years, because it generally takes about four years in law, uh, is not easy. It's quite challenging. The only bad part about it is that, uh, yeah, I'm back to being poor, you know. 
no more rich bags, Joel. So, uh, but that's okay. Life's about living, not about <laughs> money. So, first thing you're gonna have to do is stop buying all alcohol. Uh, I've actually reduced my amount I, I drink significantly already. So uh, there's that. Uh, had a bit Who of a are hot... you? What have you done with Joel? Yeah, I know, I know. It's, it's terrible. Listen, you get to a point in in life where you you uh, recognize the important things. It's about learning. It's about friendship. It's like it's about being connections. And it's only about drinking every other day as opposed to every day. That's what I'm talking about right there. Okay. So yes, big changes are coming. Can't wait. And uh, yeah, so I start in September, but I'm going to be moving to London probably in two months because I have to give notice on my apartment. And I'm moving back into uh, kind of like a funky little arts house called The Ranch with my buddy Vince, Vince Cherniak, who way back in the day was on the show briefly talking about uh, something I can't remember. So there's and, that. Well, didn't we do, <laughs> didn't, wasn't he on the, the, the episode with uh, about um, Day of the Earth Stood Still? uh yeah maybe that could maybe. be it yeah he was on the road and yeah he, he's a he's a very intelligent man let's just say that he was uh -huh. a bit hyper sometimes <laughs> there you go <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah and we're all i'm going to do a, a show and vince has been after me for years now to do commentary on about this soviet film from like 1972 ish i think it's from north 79 uh called stalker it's a tough kovetsky uh, director, mm -hmm. uh, so it was very famous, and I've seen the film back in the day, and I have a copy of it, so I'm rewatching that just so that I can do a session type episode with with Vince. So, who doesn't like Soviet sci-fi films? Really, there you go. Sure. Yeah, why not? Uh, but today we're not talking about the Soviet era of filmmaking and science fiction. We're talking about the 1997 film Contact, directed by Robert Zemeckis, and based on the 1985 book by the same name written by Carl Sagan, the famous scientist who did Cosmos back in the day, and his partner, who he later married, and Dian. Dian? Drian. Drian, thank you. God, I need to drink more tea. I'm drinking tea right now. Mm. Mm. <laughs> I came up with this topic because it's it's been a really great week for real space news. Uh, like we have the Persever Perseverance who just landed successfully on Mars. That's amazing. We had two other orbiters that uh, reached Mars. It's been a lot of good stuff. There's been a SpaceX launch this week. There's been a, a Northrop Grumman um, Cygnus launch out of Virginia this week successfully. There's a lot of great things happening. And I thought to myself, what better way to pay homage to the real-life scientists and engineers doing this type of great work than talk about a very highly influential film in science fiction that has influenced many scientists and engineers. So that's why we're doing Contact. Yay! Yay! Now, we'll be talking spoilers because it's a bar and the film's been out for like 25 years, 24 years. So there's that. If you haven't seen it, well, by all means, uh, you sh yeah, we're talking spoilers. This, the book's been out for, you know, 40 odd years. Uh, the film and the book's slightly different. Uh, but uh, yeah, you may want to turn this off if you're sensitive about spoilers. If not, continue listening to us battle over this film, Contact. Joel, what does it say under the name of the movie on your Blu-ray case? Uh, uh, let's see. It says version français. Uh, uh, okay. Yeah, I'm in Canada. Everything's in bilingual language in Canada. It's it's a law. Who knows? Do all your Canadian Blu-rays have <laughs> like French on the cover? Everything. You can't buy a box of cereal without it being bilingual. Uh, <laughs> there we go. You know, I've actually, I've actually, that's, I'm actually kind of jealous because I mean, it, it's kind of a requirement up there, yeah. Yeah, uh, considering about twenty five percent of the population, uh, first uh, their first language is French, and so there's that. So yeah, that... just to, just imagine if if you know, you know, if California were required Spanish as a second language. Yeah, I... I'm sure there. I'm sure people would be up in arms, but I mean, like, <laughs> yeah. Yes. Remember, there's not an official language for the United States of America, at least not as of yet. But there that are in Canada. True. Canada has two official languages, English and French, because it's a combination mm -hmm. of both societies because of the history of Canada and the Sorry. whole conquest get, and things in the British Empire. Yeah, stuff, it's good. I, yeah. I just find I just find that I just find that intriguing because uh, I, I think I've I think I've mentioned before I I, mm. I should be trilingual, but my mom never 
was interested in learning either language so yeah either I, either german or or spanish so yeah. eh. full disclosure i have a speech impediment and i find the french language very difficult to learn and trust me i've tried and i'm in uh, ottawa which is the capital city where there's a lot of french speakers uh living here uh the border to quebec which is mostly french it's the french province literally i can walk there in 10 minutes and uh, yeah, French is very hard. It's a language you need to learn as a child because of the way the, the language itself works. But I definitely encourage anyone to become bilingual uh, oh, yes. or trilingual. I think language is extremely important just because I'm not very talented at them. Doesn't mean others uh, shouldn't be or I'll take the challenge. So uh, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm horrible at French too. I took it for four years in high school and one year in college and I still cannot make a sentence out of it. Uh, yeah. Yeah, well, if you think yeah. if you think French if you think French is hard, try learning Japanese. <laughs> exactly, yeah. exactly. All right, but we're not here to talk about languages. Uh, That's true. You know, like, All right, uh, we're gonna move on uh, from French and Japanese to this film, Contact. Right, producers uh, Robert Zemeckis, uh, Steve Starkey, screenwriters, because he went through different several different versions before it actually was filmed. Uh, it was. Uh, uh, I don't know, shaped by James V. Hart and Michael Godenberg, uh, cinematography by Don Burgess, uh, music by Alan Silvestri, and of course the major uh, studio slash distributor, distributor was Warner Brothers. It's a long film. It's 150 minutes. I think we nearly broke Derek by making him watch this film. Because it, could there... be, it could be worse. We could have made him watch uh, 2001. That was my other suggestion. Now, yeah, we are going to do that, but that's a three-hour fun uh, deep dive. Into, I uh, remember liking 2001 as a little kid. I think I had a very different attention span back then. Oh, God. Yeah. As, 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 as uh, movies that don't do anything interesting for, mm-hmm. like, at least half of it, um, I, this is not my opinion. This is I'm I'm piggybacking off of some stuff Derek has said already. Uh, I'd rather watch Contact than 2001. <laughs> oh God, keep no. I'll save the very you know long, lengthy, more intellectual type uh, you know films when I move back with Vince and we'll get drunk and talk about like 2001. It'll be fun. Uh, yes, uh, watch us slur our words and get into fist fights. Yeah, yeah. That's probably just gonna be dude. yeah. That's probably just gonna be audio. It's probably not gonna be video. But uh, these sessional uh, you know, episodes, they're gonna be fun. But with contact, well, let's see. Uh, the budget was ninety million, and the box office intake was almost twice that. It's one hundred seventy one point one million. So this movie made money, if that means anything. But I think the the money just was secondary to the influence it's had on a lot of people who uh, pursue the the hard sciences, the STEM sciences, because. Uh, it's about discovery. It's about asking the big questions. Are we alone in the universe? Mm-hmm. Uh, what is truth? It's a search for truth. And what this film really sets up is this dichotomy, the separation between religion, truth, or religious truth, and scientific mm-hmm. truth. And it tries, the movie tries to reconcile both of them. Maybe not be successful, but at least it makes the attempt. So there's that. So uh, what I don't know, guys, w- how would you describe this movie? Uh, let's let Derek. Let's see Derek's take on this. Derek, oh dear, can you describe this movie for our our, uh, our customers? It is a overly long think piece about <laughs> making contact with aliens. Uh, now, I, I I I saw this movie once when it came out when I was a little kid, and I I had almost no memory of it whatsoever. So this is actually the first time I watched it as an adult. So I I did not remember what went on in it. And I mean, it's, it's certainly a well-made movie. I, I mean, I, I did find the first half unnecessarily slow and uneventful. I, I think that you could have cut out a lot of scenes at the beginning to make it a little tighter. But it, it is good. And, and I did enjoy the uh, debate between science and fate that did, you know, put an interesting layer to the movie that I didn't remember was going to be there. I thought it was just about, you know, building the thing and making contact with the aliens. So that was good. And I did like the way they kind of played it uh, even handed between the two sides. Because uh, can I briefly talk about the ending or are we? Sure. Saving it? Well, okay. We already before, gave the spoiler warning. Yeah. So go yeah. Ahead. But before we get to the ending, what is this movie about, anyways? Okay, we have aliens, we have contact. What is this? Is, is it, you know, uh, an alien walks into the bar and orders a drink? 
No, that would be Resident Alien, and, uh, right. which is weird. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay, so well, they they get a strange signal from the radio telescope, and then they spend the rest of the movie trying to figure out what is in that signal and what it means, and if aliens are sending it, and then that has implications for what people believe in vis-a-vis -vis religion or aliens or science, and some people overreact a little bit. Yeah, yeah. The, the tagline that's on the Blu-ray is a message from deep space who would be the first to go a journey to the heart of the universe wow impressive eh wow yeah uh, actually to, uh, as a description if i can actually read the the very fine print the exciting adventures of the day we make contact with life beyond earth comes to the screen with a profound sense of wonder and a dozen visual sweep that extends to the outer reaches of space and the imagination jody foster is an astronomer astronomer a woman of science, Matthew McConaughey. How do you say his name? I always McConaughey. His name. God, I'm sorry. He's one of my favorite actors. I can't even say his name. I'm <laughs> terrible. Uh, is a religious scholar, a man of faith. They're opposite ends of a spectrum. And suddenly, players of the world stage as a countdown to human humankind's greatest journey begins. Powerful, thrilling, and emotional. Contact connects. <laughs> now read the French half. Okay, uh, uh, Le Venture <laughs> Palpati du Premier Contact. Oh, forget that. Again, I butcher it. Okay. Learn French. If you're in Canada, learn French. Yeah, yeah. There we go. Here. Okay. Or in France or uh, French Polynesia. Oh, wherever they speak French. I don't care. <laughs> Be yourself. All uh, right. Carrie, how would you describe this movie? Um, I, I think that it is a study in part of how science works. I mean, especially, you know, astrophysics and stuff. He's like, I, I get, I get what, what Derek is trying to say about there's a lot of stuff in, especially in the first half of the movie that doesn't seem to go anywhere, but that's kind of what the, what the science is. You know, you, you know, they, they built telescopes to look for graviton particles and they didn't find anything for 50 years. So, I mean, yeah. yeah, some of the work of science is long and boring and just, you know, sitting around listening and looking and and studying until, hey, we found something. And, yeah. then, uh, and then there's the mad dash for the rest of the movie to figure out what it is and, and how, it, how it affects the world around us. And how it changes the world around us. So, yeah, that's a good description, and I uh, I would love to spend some time either in Puerto Rico or say New Mexico, wearing a Hawaiian shirt and just doing science uh, as a, like a grad student or like a you know professional, and just you know living oh, I, living the, in the lab. Those, That'd be cool. <laughs> well, the, te the telescope in in Puerto Rico isn't there anymore. Yeah, it, un yeah. unfortunately, it did went bang uh it went bang which i wrote this down uh december, december 1st, of 2020 yeah december 1st 2020 that's the Arecibo observatory uh, put a, oh god i misspelled the puerto rico, puerto rico. <laughs> okay there you go the radio telescope but uh the ones in uh, new mexico still exist i believe so there's a uh yeah yeah uh so we follow the the story through the the lens of the the, the optics of dr ellie arroway Airway? Mm -hmm. Airway. Airway. Play, Airway. Played by Jodie Foster, and who, uh, who has uh, the nickname name of Sparks as a young child. There's lots of family drama because they lost. Uh, she lost her mom through childbirth, and her dad was very influential up until um, he died when uh, poor Ellie was nine years old. So we mm -hmm. have a very personal connection, or like personal emotional trauma at the the start of the films and that motivates uh, the Jodie Foster ca character in her love and passion for science that propels the plot forward. Speaking of her Sparks nickname, yeah. I spent the whole movie waiting for her to get like electricity powers from the aliens or something and fight crime and it never happened. I know, who knew? I mean, <laughs> that was a real like misleading setup. Oh, God. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Oh, by the way, the father, who I love this actor, uh, David Morris, Morris uh, I see him in these cop shows all the time. Uh, I just saw him again in the HBO uh, Treme series. Uh, he's outstanding. Yeah, like, when I think of a dad, I think of Dave Morris, David Morse. You know, he was just so yeah, you know, fitting for that role. 
<laughs> but that's an aside. I have a, a dumb question. Like I said, I've, I've only seen this movie once as an adult. Is every single scene from Ellie's perspective, does it ever cut away from her? Because uh, it, it seemed, I, I kind of noticed it halfway through. It was like, oh, they never go to anyone else, do they? Well, it's Ellie's story. Right, no, but I mean, like, the movie literally never shows a scene where Ellie is not in the room, I think. Aside from the opening pull away of the Earth radio signals, right. I think every single scene has Ellie present in the room. Yeah, because we're talking about her internal conflict, right, between science and uh, and, her, and her trauma and her sense of loss from her parents, named, and especially her dad, right? Uh, so there's that... I think it's mostly through her lens, uh, through mm -hmm. her uh, perspective, uh, which I think makes it more personal. But uh, yeah, it's it's open for a commentary. What do you think? Well, Did it I, work? I, 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 yeah, it it worked. I also I also think uh, uh, it it's kind of a study of how you know male centric the 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 landscape was, especially back in the '90s, where you know it's like like. You know, as soon as Ch Tom Skerritt is steps in the room, he's just gonna take over because that's what he does the entire the entire time. It's like he's he's they say it in the movie. He's a grandstander. He's right. gonna go take the credit, and you know, screw yeah. everyone else, screw everyone who actually wanted to do the work. Yeah. And stuff. I mean, he didn't even he didn't even think said he was a you know viable research project. I was surprised that there was only uh, two people of color I saw, right? So mm -hmm. we have the uh, the science uh, in command leadership role of the fellow who was in Capcom, right? And then mm -hmm. we have, at the beginning of the film, we have one of the researchers in SETI uh, uh, was, uh, was, uh, was a black fellow as well, right? There's mm -hmm. a lot of white male people in this film. And you yes. have a very powerful uh, woman lead, right? Uh -huh. Which is based on a real person, by the way. So the Dr. Ellie Arroway character, the Jodie Foster character, was inspired by a real person by the name of Dr. Jill Tarter, who was uh, part of the SETI Institute. Uh, who I've actually I've listened to podcasts on her before. So she's, uh, hmm. she's still around. She's good. Uh, look her up, Jill Tarter, real scientist. Nice. Yeah, there's oh. that. Yeah. So uh. this was a true story then. No, there was no yeah. because we still haven't made contact with aliens, dude. Yeah, but there's some loosely based stuff, or like have... like the the blind fellow, so blind scientist said it said he type uh, can't uh, play by Willem Fischner. Fischner, how do you say his name? Fischner. Yeah. Fit, wait, Fischner. Yeah. Fischner. I yeah. love him because he, I I still remember from Black Hawk Down, and I think he killed that role, no pun intended. And I, <laughs> this is where I know him. Each time I see him, because he's been in acting for like thirty years, I say to myself, "Hey, that's the guy from Black Hawk Down I really like." Yes, William Fitchner. So mm -hmm. funny story. Um, I only read afterwards after watching the movie that he was blind in this movie. I had no clue he was blind. Oh come on, that's what he was. I thought there was something like you know like different about him. But I didn't know he was blind. Oh, I thought he was just shy. You, no, you mean the, hand, the whole handshake <laughs> scene didn't give it away? Maybe I wasn't looking up at the screen at that moment. But yeah, I never got that he was blind. I thought okay. he was just like very shy or, uh, you know. <laughs> Listen, we have, you know, we have, uh, you know, disability of folks in this movie, right? Okay, so that's cool, right? Okay, in, in the form of Kent. This is why he was so important when he's listening, right? So his other senses are more, more acute. In, acute, cute. right? Okay, yeah. than just visual. And actually, that character is based off of a real life fellow by the name of Kent Colors, who is another real scientist from the SETI community who was blind in real life. Nice. Right. So, this is a true story. No, it's no. more like nods yeah. and winks and yeah, than it being true. But okay, again, I saw Bill Clinton in it. He was talking oh, to the I camera see about the episode. Oh, controversy, controversy. Mm. Yes, let's get into that. Because Bill we... Clinton was in, was in Forrest Gump. That doesn't make that a true story either. Wait, that's not a true story? Mm -hmm. <sighs> Life is a, is a box of chocolates. Yes, and, and Jenny, Jenny. Why, Jenny? Why? I... Okay, uh, but yeah. Yeah. Uh... <sighs> Yeah, so uh, this film, there was some controversy in this film uh, in the sense that it did use Bill Clinton. Uh, of course, Bill Clinton was talking about something completely different in real life, and they mm -hmm. uh, edited it so that it fit into the movie. 
Also, they use uh, CNN reporters a lot, real reporters, which has since uh, is not allowed by CNN because of this movie, because you're, you're merging between real news and fictional movies, and that's probably Maybe it's thing. not allowed anymore. Talk, um, not... Uh, Anderson Cooper was in BBS. Oh yeah, it was a lot yeah. by, by portraying it as himself. I actually, I read on the Wikipedia yeah. page. I'm sure there's some internal policies that are going on that they don't want to cheapen the brand. But who knows? I'm sure there's exceptions to every rule. Also, uh, Rachel Maddow is in like every episode of Batwoman. Really? Well, yeah, she, mm-hmm. yeah, she's um, the voice of Best for Parent, oh. Parent Well, do they play reporters? And trying to show that yeah, they're actually you don't showing see her face. She's just like the radio voice giving news about what's yeah. going on in Gotham City. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Well, of course, we do have Larry King in this movie, right? Who, who just uh, recently passed. Who just recently yeah. passed. And uh, yeah, and, and there's some contra- like not controversy. There's a lot of conversation between uh, the far Christian right, portrayed by, of all people, Rob Lowe. Now that's great casting. Right? Okay. <laughs> well, and Jake and Jake Busey. Oh yeah, yeah. Who uh, it plays a a terrorist? Yeah, an uh, yeah, yeah. 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 He, he yeah. blew up the, the the machine and killed dozens of people. Right. Yeah. I was Cost surprised right. that Rob Lowe was in it, but only in a couple scenes. Like mm-hmm. his character appeared a couple times at the beginning and then just disappeared for the rest of the movie. I was like, where did he go? I know, I know. I, I can't believe uh, there was a very brief scene with uh, uh, an Air Force major, Major John Russell. He's played by Stephen Ford, who's actually the son of, of the former president, Gerald Ford. How cool nice. is that? Yeah, who knew? Very cool. Yeah, uh, and, of course, one of the major people in the White House, uh, in terms of who's, you know, political people, the character name is Rachel Constantine. Cast- Constantine. Constantine. But she was played uh, by Angela Bassett who also played the queen and the mother in uh, Black Panther. Yes, so, and she's awesome. She's great. So, hey, th- uh, sorry, that's another uh, person of color. So there's at least three people. That, that's good. So Yeah, there were a lot of celebrities in this. Yeah, I, yeah. I don't know how famous they were at the time this movie came out, but, yeah, there, it was quite a list. Yeah, and, of course, you, you, know, you have, like, uh, Tom Skerritt, who plays David Drimlin, who's this... Uh, uh, head scientist type who just takes credit and uh, just is a political animal, and then you have the the NSA uh, like paranoid uh, defense guy James Wood uh, plays a uh, character named Michael Kitts. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I know. So I, were... I, 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 I kind of wanted to punch Tom Skerritt every time he was on every time he was on the screen. Yeah. It like... makes me... I don't. What is with Tom Skerritt and James Wood? They both play assholes so well. You know, you know like like literally, I see them and, you, and I think to myself, they're jerks. Okay. Yeah. In real life, I hope not. But the characters they play and they portray. Well, yeah. well, um, James, James Woods Wood apparently is apparently yeah. an yeah. asshole yeah. in real life. But um, yeah. I don't know about Skerritt. I don't. I don't know if he's alive. I haven't heard anything. Yeah. Uh, yeah. He's yeah. also in Top Gun, right? So he, he plays okay, uh, a good character in yeah. Top Gun. Uh, That's another movie I only just recently saw for the first time as an adult. <laughs> okay. So according to the internet, he's still alive. Stay healthy, Tom. Uh, but he's uh, 87, so he's getting up there in age. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. He, uh, he became famous with this TV series back in the day, Picket Fences. Anyone? There you go. Well, no, no, um, I think that was a show in the 90s. He was an alien back in, what was that, 78? Oh, right, yeah, okay. Oh, talking about alien, we have John Hurt as well, right? Oh, yeah. Right, yeah. okay. Who's it took played... me a long time to recognize him. He looks so different bald. <laughs> oh, yeah. But... Some Several people look different bald, and like, like suddenly, it's like, whoa. Yeah. Yeah. So John Hurt, uh, who's uh, I believe he's passed, right? So he's yes, yeah. he's he the war doctor uh, in Doctor Who, uh, and uh, he's a great stage actor. He's been around forever. He yeah, he died in 2017 at age 77. Mm-hmm. Uh, John Hurt, uh, yeah, amazing. Sir John Hurt, if you uh, count his knighthood, because he's British. Uh, so he plays this fellow by the name of S. R. Hayden, which is this uh, billionaire, millionaire, you know, rich guy who, uh, you know, uh, he's eccentric. He's older. He uh, lives on a plane. He doesn't like touching down. That's a kind of. He's like on. he's 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 kind of like the Elon Musk of the nineties. Yeah, kind of right. 
Uh, yeah. yeah what, what, what's this game? What he's getting at, right? Can you believe him? And that's the political intrigue that happens in this movie where, you know, you have science, you have religious faith, and then you got politics. Yeah. 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 So here's an interesting first-timer opinion. I The only two vague memories I had of this movie was that, you know, like she meets an alien at the end and that um, a telescope or, or like the, the thing blows up halfway through. I spent the entire movie convinced that McConaughey was going to be the one to blow up the machine. I thought he was the bad guy the whole time and that he was just like sleeping with her to like, you know, infiltrate the facility. So I was actually shocked when he had nothing to do with it. Yeah. <laughs> hey, well, let me ask you the big question. If suddenly tomorrow we wake up and there's uh, evidence, strong direct evidence that there's intelligent life form outside of Earth in the universe, how do you think people would react? Uh, that's a good question. I don't think I don't think we have a good answer for that. Yeah, because I know if you dabble into the whole UFO podcasting online uh, you know, circle, and I don't recommend that because there's a lot of really inter like strange happenings and conspiracies and, quite frankly, idiots and disbelief. But there's a lot of interesting t storytelling. That's why I yeah sometimes I dabble just to listen. If you dive that, there, there's this thing called disclosure where what happens when the U.S. government admits there's aliens and then people will go nuts. Personally, I don't think so. I think that's just so old fashioned. Personally, I think people do what people do, you know. Uh, I don't think it's going to bring in direct question issues of faith. Uh, but that's just me. I, I, I think it depends. I think it depends on the group. I, and I think that this movie did a very good job in, you know, illustrating the various ways, various groups you know, handle the idea of, you know, are we alone in the universe? Some of them, some people are like, Hey, Hey, let's, let's go party with the aliens. And the others are like, no, let's go blow them up. It's kind of, you know, yeah. I mean, we, well, we don't have, we don't have full on, you know, cricket war type stuff, but it, it's getting there. I mean, we did have one guy try to, you know, blow up the, um, blow up the first machine, which I, I I will admit I I I don't encourage suicide bombings, but there I there was a bit of a, a Schadenfreude moment where it's like, <laughs> yep, Tom Scarry's character. This is why you don't volunteer. Yeah, there's a. <laughs> that was one of the parts of the movie I had a problem with because in this day and age, in early 2021. I just found it highly implausible that a right wing religious wacko could storm a federal facility with such poor security and, you know, commit violence like that with no one to stop him. Yeah, oh, that would never happen. Where, where 2021. Wait, 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 I mean, wait, come wait, on. wait, 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 Derek, where were you last month? <laughs> I was cleaning, remember? Oh, God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, in, in all seriousness, I, I probably would have found that kind of stuff to be kind of unrealistic if I'd seen this a couple of years ago. But now I find it completely believable, unfortunately. Well, I mean, I mean, you you don't even have to talk. You don't even have to talk aliens. You could, you know, look at the various reactions to the pandemic over the past year. It's like, yeah. yeah. Come on. Yeah. You really you really you really think this like a large percentage of this planet is ready to deal with aliens seriously i, I know uh, yeah, after Sorry. the pandemic and after the four years which of the last presidency uh, that fellow right yeah i i think aliens is just no big thing who cares right it's well, not the, the strangest I mean, thing in the room let's just say that <laughs> the, the the u.s government has actually flat out said that ufos exist recently they've declassified footage and stuff and they they flat out said they they don't know what it is yeah. So, I mean, they basically have admitted the existence of UFOs. Not that that's necessarily aliens, but... Yeah, that's a big assumption there. Uh, I don't know. But it's neat. Yeah, it, yeah. it definitely gets the imagination going. And uh, it is shocking to me that that hasn't had more of an impact on our society. That, like, the government, is, you know, is saying, here is UFO footage. 
we don't know what this is and it just kind of got lost in the shuffle of the news cycle yeah like it's a different thing if there's an invasion fleet right and it's like independence day and here we are and it's going to be full-on human and people genocide. are partying on the rooftops in la <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah exactly uh, what 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 could happen really oh well I don't think Carl Sagan was getting at the whole evil alien threat thing. I, I think this movie's not about that. But it's funny because Mars Attacks, Attack, right, uh, came out the year before. So contrast mm-hmm. these two movies. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah <laughs> That's there we go. Well, it, when, did, when did Independence came, Day come out? What was that? Was the 96. 94, 95? 96? 96? Exactly. The year before. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. I have to admit, I think the opening shot in this film is amazing. Yeah, that was haunting. That was right. really good. Well, yeah. you, you you pull back from Earth through the solar system to the outer reaches of the galaxy. Then you go past that to all the different galaxies. At the same time, you have the audio going where you have radio waves being emitted from Earth and they get weaker and weaker until there's just silence. And mm-hmm. the camera is still going back. So the, the scope, uh, the perspective is still being increased. The, you know, I think this this shot, this continuous shot, is amazing, and it makes this movie in many ways because I'd it for- laid, laid the groundwork for everything. Yeah. Oh yeah, I I had forgotten about that, and I I it was like I flipped the movie on, I was looking at my phone, and like it's really quiet, and I'm like, oh shit, and I was like I had to rewind, and I was like, oh that is the that is the beginning of the movie, <laughs> forgot. Oh man, oh man. Uh, yeah, I'm pouring myself some tea, some more tea. And I, I've been getting the habit of using a, 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 a teapot. Yeah, don't judge mm-hmm. me. Yes, I'm not. that's I'm, the tea. I'm being civilized. I oh, know dear. it's terrible, absolutely terrible. Uh, so I don't. Uh, at the beginning of the movie, they, they make the point uh, there's uh, 400 billion stars out there in our galaxy alone. If one out of each, I don't know, million had a planet, uh, mathematically, uh, there's going to be aliens somewhere, right? So it's basically yeah. a loose description on the Drake theory, or Drake you know, formula, right? Life in, uh, in, in, in the universe. Of course, what I find fascinating is that the book and the movie came out before the discovery of exoplanets. Now yes. there's like, we know of at least, uh, was it 400 or, or is it 1,000 now exoplanets? So it, 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 it's out there. This is big news because it's only, mm-hmm. we have only discovered these things in the last couple of decades. Well, I mean, yeah. I, I mean, consider that like, I think the Andromeda strain was written like the year before we landed on the moon. Yeah. So it's like, it, it, it's, that kind of stuff is just eerie. And you you know start to think about like oh yeah, um, this okay. <laughs> they weren't very, they weren't very far off. Okay, I just looked it up because I was curious about this, and I hate throwing out stats when I don't know it, and, and I want more exact figures and ballpark figures sometimes. So according to the Wikipedia page for exoplanets, it says as of February first, two thousand twenty-one, there are four thousand four hundred and fourteen confirmed exoplanets. And 3,257 systems, with 722 systems having more than one planet. Okay, so wow. we got ballpark. We got about 4,500 planets out there, exoplanets that exist outside our of our solar system. That I have help. a dumb question. Exoplanet. That means that it's outside of the solar system. Yeah, that's right. As so wouldn't said. that mean that it couldn't sustain life because it's not close enough to a star? Oh no, because it, it revolves around their own their, its own stars. Right, so look at it from a from a human centric perspective, right? So we have planets in our solar system. Planets in other solar systems are known as exoplanets. Oh, oh, oh. Okay, so you're just talking about a planet not in our solar system. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm sorry. I thought you meant a planet outside of any solar system. Okay. No, never no, mind. No. Never mind. No, the, the whole. No, those, uh, will be, uh, those will be rogue planets. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we haven't yeah. found planet was a planet nine in our solar system yet, but some people think it exists. That's for a different show, okay? <laughs> when I have to well, bring out some did, real scientists did, to talk about have, it. <laughs> we did have, well, we did have a planet died, but it got demoted. <laughs> yeah, to Pluto. We've been uh, looking. We've uh, been looking for Planet Ten all this time, <laughs> and what, what we found out is we really are looking for Planet Nine. Yeah, it's like, like I believe we, Pluto was reclassified as a planet again recently. No, I don't think so. I think mm-hmm. the latest on that, and there's still some debate, is that uh, it's part of the uh, weather. 
term they use for like large asteroids, small planetary shaped things. And then of course we're talking about a language and each time you use a reference in science it has a specific meaning. And of course they change the meanings. I don't know. Let us know if you know that know the answer. Uh, I like the line they use in this movie is like looking for patterns in the chaos. I like that. You know, yeah. I think that's we, we do the same thing when we look at movies and and, and books and science fiction, right? We try and look for meaning. It's, it's a search mm -hmm. for truth. So meaning and truth. And, then, and then there's slightly difference between meaning and truth, but it's related, I think. Yeah. Um, Vega. I have a dumb yeah. question about McConaughey's character. When he first appears, he says he's just a reporter trying to get an interview, but that was a lie. And then at the party, he says that he was a defrocked priest. And then I, I kind of was under the impression that he was just some kind of religious guy. But then he shows up at the White House in a suit, and he seems to have as much authority as Tom Skerritt. So I was confused. What what exactly was he in terms of the organization structure? I, I think he's just the, 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 the religious guy, right? The famous spiritual religious advisor. spiritual thinker type. So it's okay. kind of like it because he had a lot of authority with the project. Yeah, and, and this is a fair criticism of this movie and his character is like, wow, but you know, it kind of necessary to have that in order to bring out the themes of you know, of religious faith versus scientific well, knowledge, right? Mm -hmm. And yeah, you have to buy into it. You're right. Uh, there's a lot of things in this movie I don't buy into, but some of it's kind of interesting in terms of art and storytelling. So he had no, so he had no actual position with the government. He was just a religious person, and he was brought in onto a committee to make he decisions. Was like an he was like an advisor. Okay. Yeah. yeah. All right. Yeah. yeah, and which is kind of strange because uh, you know we think you know say the United States government being uh, non-religious, but I can see certain aspects of the U.S. government being very religious. So uh, that's just politics. Uh, yeah, well, yeah. It, it, uh, yeah. yeah, I know. I thought it was funny that they said in this movie that um, her being atheist means she doesn't represent 95% of the country. I'm, I'm pretty sure I recently saw a stat that um, it's more like 90% uh, or even less than 90% at this point. So it's funny yeah, how much that number has dropped since then. Yeah. yeah, it is what it is, right? So there's that. Uh, I think this movie suffers from only having one Elvis. I think it needs more Elvises. Is that? Hey, what do you think about the whole uh, uh, right away from the 1936 Summer Olympics? I thought that, that was kind of cool. That is fucking. That is fucking scary. It's just like, oh, that that's the first thing that we sent away. We sent off off planet. Yeah. From the that, from Berlin, Germany. I, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I thought that was a good a good little thing. Uh, and so, I like to, to borrow from Captain Kirk, you know, it's like you're not really catchy us at our best. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Fortunately they got I Love Lucy like right after that to balance it out. Yeah, there's that. Mm. Yeah. And then they got Wanda Vision. No, okay. Uh that's <laughs> <laughs> I do like that the portrayal of science in this movie, right? The fact they got the signal from outer space through their radio telescope and the first thing they do is they try to corroborate the data with other sources of of, of like other stations, mm -hmm. other other satellite stations, right? To yeah. make sure that they they hear the same thing or they see the same thing by using the scientific method, right? So mm -hmm. uh, to uh, uh, make sure you can do you get the same results when you do that, it's amazing. And then we by adding ten minutes to a long run time. <laughs> <laughs> I think that was worth it. Uh, it, I believe it was worth it too. Like I said, it, it it shows the work that needs to go into stuff like this. Yeah, yeah. And then there's of course the military involvement. The military involvement is like, oh my god, what do we do? Do we hush it up? Wait, it's in the public already. So what do we do? Oh, let's lie to the public. Ah, uh, there's no safety concerns about there. There's no there's no risk to uh, to the public. Yeah, and then watch everyone going nuts, right? Uh, and uh, like again, going back to the question, if you discover there's going to be intelligent aliens out there, is it going to cause a, a, a bunch of mass suicides, right? Uh, which has happened before, right? Yeah, you know, was it uh, Heaven's Gate? Heaven's Gate, yeah, do that, right? Okay, that uh, actually happened just a few months before the movie came out, and they hastily looped in some lines about it to make the movie. Yeah, I, I yeah. noticed that. You know, and the other thing too is that uh, will people attack the scientists, right? Will people attack not just the science, but the, the way of thinking? 
You know, there was a sign in the movie that says, science is not our God. Yeah, who does and that? And look at what happened to Dr. Fauci. He has to have security guards around the clock now because of the way he was treated last year. Yeah. Yeah. S scary stuff. And, and do you think, do you think the, the you know, governments, in this case, specifically the United States government, will spend trillions of dollars on building some sort of alien machine? Was that realistic? I, I think de I think depending on the administration, yes. If it was <laughs> if it was the you know Clinton or or Obama administration, sure. It would if it was the uh, the past administration, probably not. Yeah. Not, uh... unless, not, not, not unless not unless the, the not unless his name got put on it somehow. Yeah. I just yeah. go ahead, Dirk. The other thing to think about is that this was in the Clinton era when the economy was actually booming and doing amazingly yeah. well. So, you know, they, I'm sure they <laughs> had the, the money thing. to spend then. And plus, that was right after the Cold War. So all that money they were spending on military expenditures and ICBMs, they were able to shift over a little bit. I love the fact that the Japan built their own machine. Yeah, that's something I think that you know, Japanese would do just because they, they're so well. in tune with, with technology. It's amazing. Well, it's it's what well it's what had it's what hadn't said. You know, why build one when you can build build two at the same price? Yeah, and it's just the, it's a it's like okay, we have the space shuttle program. Was there a military version of the space shuttle program? Well, there's mm -hmm. been no public evidence of that, but maybe I don't know. It's, it's a conspiracy theory. Who knows? Okay. <laughs> yeah, and let's talk about you know when our main character Ellie Arroway actually goes through this machine gets dropped through the center of this machine which kind of looks like kind of like a like a atom of some type or some sort of molecule right in, in terms of mm -hmm. this visual design and she's dropped into the chair of course they edit the chair in because this is what humans do it was in the instruction book by the aliens but hey we'll, we can make it better and yeah, nope nope no, nope no, not, no. not 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 happen not not do, not gonna do it nope no, nope never. someone else someone else can do that yeah. like i'll I'll go. I'll go into. I'll go into space when when you know we have you know shuttles, like <laughs> like the like the Galileo Seven type shuttle. Yeah, I'm the same way. Um, yeah, I don't. I don't like drops, so I never would have done that thing where it drops you from the top of a crane down, 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 down into the water. No. <laughs> like, nope. Well, but but no, it, it's not even that. It's just the timing of things. You're you're because it's supposed to you know you you have things. Going, yeah, uh, right, like, crisscrossing you underneath you. It's like, things? like, like, no, no, hell no, I'm not doing that. <laughs> like, I don't even, I don't, I don't even want to go skydiving. Uh, I would not do it out of my own free will. How's that? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I hate roller coasters. I hate straight drops. I wanna, I, yeah. Uh, when, when, once you've sent like you know a couple thousand people through the thing, maybe then I'll, I, I, I'd consider it. Yeah. But, I would go through a wormhole. That would be pretty cool, right? And, Einstein oh, yeah. and Rosenbridge, uh, you know, oh, yeah. that would be trippy. I would love that. And I thought that was pretty well done, considering it's part of these hardcore, thinking type science fiction tropes, right? Like from 2001 or Interstellar, where there's a, an act that's all about reflection, right? The whole meeting the alien who, you know, who puts on the face of of the main character's uh, father who passed away and reading a lot of meaning, personal meaning into that. What do you guys make make of that? The whole meeting the alien scene. It was interesting. I mean, I mean, yeah, I I kind of get what the alien was trying to do because I mean, if it if there if if the aliens are aware enough that they know that their appearance might freak people might freak people out, you know, making themselves look more like uh, something like someone else uh, a human could handle might work otherwise you know uh, you know other we the human humans might you know set up their you know someone else's problem field and just not not do it hey can i just be lonely like we're by ourselves in the cosmos right uh, there's some existential angst there sure but you know that's probably using occam's razor probably mm. can probably to be the truth of the matter but who knows yeah I know, the other thing so. you have to think about is their introduction to humanity was Hitler, so they probably thought, eh, we probably shouldn't look too different from them if we uh, want to make a good first impression. That, that, that's, that's a good point, yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. I love the fact this beach, there's large bodies of water. These these 
amazing visual shots of the universe, right? Okay, it's cosmos, cosmic. It's the cosmos itself. It, it, yeah, it's like going outside in big sky territory and looking up with not a soul around you and realizing you are so small in the eyes of the universe. To me, or that's... even or even in New Mexico, because yeah. you you there are places in New Mexico where it's like that. It's like oh, yeah, yeah. oh there's nothing here. To me, I love when I feel that when I go out by myself in the middle of nowhere and you just see, you just, you, I like, I bathe in it, right? And it's a great humbling experience, and knowing it's full well that hey, all you mundane little anxiety, you know, like issues and your anxiety, eh, the universe may care, probably not. Okay, <laughs> we'll see. What do you guys think? You think this uh, film should be considered a classic, a must-watch? No. Um, <laughs> I I don't know I don't know that it's a must watch for you know the vast majority of the country or the human population. I think that it's a good humbling experience for those of us who um you know, need to you know need just the reinforcement of you know. You, you you guys you guys have seen the big posters of the of the of the cosmos with the little little arrow saying you are here. Yeah, the pale blue dot. Uh, yeah, or the pale or the pale blue dot. You know, it's mm. like okay, yeah, we need. I think I think more people need that kind of thing. I just don't know how many people are open to that kind of you know humbling experience. Mm. Interesting, Derek. What's your take? Uh, does I do this... think that Independence Day is the definitive uh, first contact movie. No, no, scratch that. <laughs> no. Independence Day Re Resurrection, the sequel. Oh, okay. That is the definitive movie about aliens, yes. No, but all, all joking aside, um, it's a good movie. I, I don't think it's a all-time classic. I don't have any kind of nostalgic connection to it like you guys do. I, I think if we're talking about uh, artistic alien contact type movies i think that arrival and annihilation were both better films than this one was and had more to say than this one did but it, i mean it, it was a good movie it's, it's not something i'm going to be dying to watch again anytime soon but okay fair enough personally i thought this is a good movie it's a classic if you're into first contact type movies if you're into science movies and just uh, just discovery uh, this is a great movie is it perfect? By far, no. Is the science perfect in this movie? No, it's not. It's not. But there's the themes there, which they spent some time addressing, and I think that's valuable. And I really like the opening shot of this movie. So that's my take. Yeah, agreed. All right, guys. Uh, let's close our doors for this session of the Sci-Fi Pubcast because there's living to be done out there somewhere, right? <laughs> okay, okay. Sure. So let's see. This show is released as a podcast and on YouTube. Subscribe today. Check out our Discord channel. Uh, there's a free invite uh, on a social media for the Discord. It's a great source of news and discussion. We are also on social media. We have three channels. We have Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. I do the Twister, uh, tr tr Twitter and Instagram, and Derek does the Facebook page. Hey, Derek, you're doing a great job with the Facebook page. Just saying. Thank you. And with the free advertising. There you go. There you go. <laughs> uh, so if you want to send us an email, you can, you can do that. Our email address is management at sci-fi podcast dot space. Carrie, what's your handle? My Twitter handle is Carrie Blackfire 42. That's K-E-R-I Blackfire 42. And what other podcasts are you on? I am also on DC Talk. Uh Cape Chronicles. Yeah, I had I had to stop and think about that for a second. Uh, Cape Chronicles and Enter the Dojo, and occasionally I guest on some of the other podcasts over on the Random Chatter Network. And all but these that's yeah. rare. And all these shows are on the Random Chatter Network. I know Correct. you were on their main flagship show, Random Chatter, uh, last week. Definitely check yeah, that out. Yeah, I sub. Yeah, I subbed in. I subbed in last week. It was fun. Cool. Uh, and you can actually watch her on YouTube on the the Random Chatter uh, YouTube channel. So was because I did that. I did that last week, Harry. Yeah, you told me. Thank you. There you Thank go. You. Uh, Derek, what's your Twitter address? I am at Derek J. B. B. 
Oh, and uh, I forgot to bring up one point. Um, I thought that the ending was particularly interesting, not that she meets the alien, but that she gets back and has no proof of it and nobody believes her. I thought that was a really great fuck you ending that, that yeah. really elevated the story. I, I, I did. But, I, I didn't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to spoil it so much, but yeah, that's a good point, right? <laughs> yeah. But, but her, but her record, her, her video has, has 18 hours of static, even though yeah, she's only but, gone but, for but like, that like nobody knows minute, about. That nobody knows about yeah. because yeah. That's the, that, that video is going into the same vault with the, um, you know, Ark of the Covenant and all that. Yeah. Yeah. Give it time. Oh, wait. Give it time. <laughs> uh, uh, let's see. Uh, our friend, the show, Runner Graham, uh, he's still around, my new boss. Uh, and uh, yeah, buy his bucks. Uh, Before Life and Afterlife Prices by ECW Press. There's that. I'm on Twitter <laughs> at Joel underscore Welch. W E L C H. It's closing time. Please uh, take care and make it home safely. We'll see you next time. Bye now. Oh. Bye. Bye. Music provided courtesy of Logan Rathbone. Podcast logo by Drew Copyrighted Joe Welch. Listen responsibly. And we can't wait for your next visit to our fine establishment. Cheers.